Designing and installing your own solar power system can feel intimidating and overwhelming. I know firsthand what that can feel like because that's exactly how I felt when I put together the solar power system for our off-grid tiny house. In this video, we'll cover the basic components of our system, how we figured out the specifications each component needed to be for our system, and how we ultimately installed everything. My hope is that after watching this entire video, designing and building your very own solar power system will seem much less daunting. But before we get started, just a quick warning. Electricity is extremely dangerous. Seriously, do not attempt to build a solar power system or mess with electricity if you feel like it's too difficult. Consult with a certified electrician, that's what we did, or just have one install your system just to play it safe. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get into it. The main components of our solar power system are the solar panels with roof-mounted hardware, the charge controller, which also serves as our monitoring system, the battery bank, the inverter, and the breaker slash fuse panel with built-in converter. In addition to the components of the system, we also had to ensure that we were using the right gauge wiring and fuses between the panels, the charge controller, the batteries, and the inverter. It's also important to note that we have the system grounded to the trailer of the tiny house. So here's how the components come together to generate power. When the sun shines onto a panel, energy from the sunlight is absorbed by the photovoltaic cells in the panel. This energy creates electrical charges that move in response to an internal electrical field in the cell causing electricity to flow. From there, the electricity flows to the charge controller, which keeps the batteries from overcharging by regulating the voltage and current coming from the solar panels to the battery. The charge controller can also trickle charge your batteries when they are full to help maintain their charge. The batteries, of course, store excess electricity generated by the solar panels. Batteries provide DC or direct current power, so to get the energy to the receptacles and devices in your home, it needs to be inverted by using a power inverter, which then distributes the electricity to an AC or alternating current breaker panel. In our house, we use a breaker panel designed for recreational vehicles that supports both AC breakers and DC fuses. The electricity can also flow to fuses in the panel, utilizing DC power to directly power things that utilize direct current. This enables us to power certain devices like our lighting and water pumps, which use direct current from the battery bank. This is a more economical use of the power since it does not have to pass through an inverter. The breaker panel also has a built-in converter, which means if the battery bank gets too low on stored power, we can charge it back up by using a generator. To power things back up with a generator, we simply plug the generator into the house using a 30 amp cable and receptacle that is hardwired to the breaker panel, flip a switch, and once the breaker panel detects AC power coming in from the generator, a built-in converter kicks in and starts to recharge the batteries. It's also important to have the proper fuses at various points throughout the system to protect the components from excessive current. We'll cover how to correctly size your fuses in greater detail later in the video. So how do you figure out which panels, charge controller, batteries, inverter, and fuses you need? It may not be very exciting, but the answer is math. Wait, don't run away. We created an easy to use sheet to help. There's simply no way to know what your system requirements are without this step. Okay, so you can see that in our sheet, it starts by listing each appliance or device that we plan to power sorted by AC and DC power. We then listed the quantity for each of the items we plan to send power to. From there, we listed the watts, also known as the power rating for each of those items. Most appliances or electrical devices have the wattage printed on them. If you only have an item's amps and voltage, you can multiply those numbers together to get your watts. The next column is the total watts for that load, which is obtained by multiplying the item quantity and the individual item wattage. Then we estimated how many hours per day and how many days per week we think we'll need to power each load. From there, we multiplied our total watts for each load by the number of hours per day we think we will use each item, and then again by the number of days per week we estimated we would use it. Then divide that number by the total number of days per week, which is of course seven, and that is how you arrive at your average daily watt hour for each load. You can add both AC and DC totals if you need the total system watt hour requirement. Divide again by 12 if you're running a 12 volt battery bank for each load and multiply that total by 1.2 to account for charge efficiency. And that gives you your total amp hour requirement. You can add up all the daily amp hours from each line since they will both be drawing power from the same battery bank. To determine the size of our solar array, we use the following formula. We took the total average daily watt hours needed divided by four being the average sun hours for our location multiplied by an efficiency factor of 1.15. 
The efficiency factor is the portion of energy in the form of sunlight that can be converted via photovoltaics into electricity by the solar cell. To determine the peak sun hours in your location, you can use the link provided here. As you can see, the minimum wattage our panels would need to generate would be 348.5. To determine our battery bank size, we use the following formula. We took our daily energy use again, but this time converted it from watts to kilowatts by dividing the total by 1000. Then we multiply that by the number of days that we would like to be able to run our system off of stored power in the event that we need to go for days with little to no sun. Then we divide that by one minus the state of charge that we can draw our batteries down to to arrive at the minimum stored kilowatt hours we need to get out of our batteries. Generally speaking, the state of charge or SOC is around 50% for lead acid and AGM batteries, but lithium ion batteries can be discharged much further. Your battery manufacturer can provide you with the specs on max depth of discharge for the battery you are interested in. From there, we multiply the battery bank kilowatt hours by 1000 and then divide that by the battery bank voltage, which in our case is 12. The number produced by this equation tells us the minimum number of amp hours our battery bank needs to be. When building your battery bank, you can connect your batteries in either series, which increases the voltage, in parallel, which increases the amp hour capacity, or by combining them in series parallel, which increases the voltage and amp hour capacity. In our case, we chose to wire our battery bank in a series parallel configuration, as our AGM batteries are six volts with a 310 20 hour rate per battery. Doing so puts our battery bank voltage at 12 volts, with approximately 620 amp hours, which is right where the equation told us we need to be. To determine the size of the inverter, we considered what the total watts of all of our loads added up to to achieve the minimum wattage required. We also made sure to look for an inverter that was rated similarly to our solar panel array at 600 watts. Lastly, to determine the size of the MPPT charge controller, we needed to ensure the unit could handle the voltage, wattage, and amperage from the solar array and the battery bank. That meant it would need to be able to handle 600 watts at 12 volts and 50 amps. I'll drop a link for this sheet in the description of the video so you can use it to determine what components you need for your system. To determine the correct gauge wiring to use to connect all of the components of the solar system and for each run in the house to connect the lights and receptacles, we use an online wire gauge calculator. I'll drop another link to one of those in the description below. To determine the right size fuse between the charge controller and the battery bank, you simply need to match the amperage rating on the charge controller. Determining the size of the fuse you need between your panels and the charge controller depends on whether or not your panels are connected in series, parallel, or series parallel. If they are wired in series, you first need to determine the total amperage of a single panel. Since the panels are wired in series, the amperage does not change. It would be the same as a single panel. Now, if your system is wired in parallel, the amperage adds up, but the voltage stays the same. Simply add up the amperage for each panel and multiply it by a factor of 25%. The last fuse to consider is the fuse between your battery bank and your inverter. The required fuse size is usually listed in the manual for the inverter, but the formula for this fuse is to take the inverter's continuous watts, divide that by the battery voltage, and multiply that by 1.25. Now that we looked in detail at how we determine the size and power rating for each of the components of our solar power system, here's how we put it all together. The first step in installing our off-grid solar and electrical system was to run the wiring to all the fixtures in the house. We made sure to drill the holes far enough into the studs using a 90 degree angle bit so that the wires would not be punctured by any of the interior siding nails. You can also buy metal plates to cover these spots on your studs to prevent them from hitting the wires. With all of the wiring in place, including grounding the entire system to the tiny house trailer, we then started wiring all of the main components of the solar system together. When connecting everything together, we made sure to assemble the battery bank in series parallel, and then connected the battery bank to the charge controller and the inverter. From there, we connected everything to our breaker panel, being very careful not to short circuit anything in the process. Lastly, we connected the solar panels to the charge controller, and as mentioned previously, we had all the appropriately sized fuses in place. Turning on that first light after connecting everything together felt absolutely amazing. Truthfully, this video would need to be over an hour long to document every tiny detail of the process, and every build is different, but my hope is that seeing how a non-professional builder could pull it off empowers you to design and build your own off-grid system. With that said, let me know in the comments if you have questions, or even if you have suggestions on how we can improve our system. It would mean a lot if you would like and subscribe as it took a really long time to put this video together. I genuinely appreciate it and thanks for watching.